welcome to the Employment Group podcast. On our latest episode, we're talking about protected characteristics and whether we need more of them. And um, the background to this is that it's over 40 years since we started in the UK introducing legislation to protect people from prejudice in the workplace and in other contexts as well. And the framework that has underpinned that protection ever since uh, has been this concept of protected characteristics. But in recent years, the pace of change, societal change in particular, has accelerated in relation to recognising individual beliefs and characteristics that are worthy of respect in a democratic society. And the question we want to ask ourselves today is how out of step with that change is the current set of protected characteristics? Uh, do we in fact have a flexible baseline that allows the law to evolve? Can the courts adapt and evolve the position to cover are changing times or should we be adopting a dramatically different model that doesn't seek to define the specific characteristics at all? Um, what would the consequences of that be for employers in terms of managing conflict in the workplace, certainty around what the law provides? And how does in practical terms an employer with a global presence grapple with the different legislation that sits in different jurisdictions uh, for different parts of its workshop force who will be interacting across borders and we know more and more frequently um, we see interaction across borders in in the global workforce uh, more frequently than ever so there's lots of issues for us to talk through on this um, session really looking forward to getting into this and thankfully I've got two colleagues here that can actually answer those difficult questions um, and talk through some of the ideas that um, that gives for rise to. So with me to discuss protected characteristics are Rebecca Thornley Gibson, partner in the employment team, with over 30 years experience of seeing the good, the bad, and as she puts it, the downright ugly in employment relations. And Rebecca has significant experience working with international organizations. And so she's seen firsthand some of these tensions that you get with um, different legislative regimes in different countries and trying to uh, allow them to come together and interact in a way that doesn't give you uh, serious risks around conflict and employee relations issues. And Abigail Maino, partner in the employment team as well, who's dealt with a myriad of discrimination claims over the years. Um, one, most, if not all of them, I'm sure in the tribunal, uh, Abigail. And she's well versed in helping clients navigate complex legal issues and concepts that we get around discrimination legislations and the, the ER issues associated with it. So, um, Good. Um, Abigail, should we kick off with you and maybe you can give us a quick history lesson, probably starting, I think, in around the 70s, uh, of how this UK legislative approach for protecting workers in particular, um, based on protected characteristics, has developed? Yeah. Hi, Adam. Yeah, of course. Um, you do indeed need to go back to uh, the 70s to see the introduction of discrimination legislation in the UK. Um, and the first bit was in 1975, where the Sex Discrimination Act was introduced. Um, prior to that date, employers could ask women, you know, about their plans for a family. And in certain roles, women would have to leave when they got married. So the introduction of that act together with the Equal Pay Act in 1970 helped to address some of the significant discriminatory acts in the workplace um, towards women. although many would acknowledge that progress for women and those identifying as women has been slow and of course you know we're all aware even to this day the government is looking at enhancing protection for pregnant and recently returning mothers um, from maternity leave against redundancy so um, things are still evolving and developing um, shortly after the sex discrimination act the uh, race relations act was introduced in 1976 and that set out some important and fundamental rights to prevent discrimination on the grounds of race, colour, nationality or ethnic or national origin. Some of the language you can see flowing through to the protected characteristics we're familiar with today. And then somewhat surprisingly, it's, um, um, there's a bit of a wait until the mid 90s for the next bit of legislation, um, the Disability Discrimination Act. And I think many people will be surprised that it took that long um for such a bit of uh, such an act to be introduced um and that um 
covered uh, concepts of, of what we define as, as a disability and some of the positive obligations that employers have um, towards those with disabilities in the workplace. Um, and other regulations were introduced um, in the early and mid 2000s um, covering religious belief, sexual orientation and age. Um, and those different pieces of legislation protected um, what we used to be referred to as strands of discrimination law, broadly what we now refer to as, as protected characteristics. Um, and while the law was um, in relation to each strand was similar, there were um, important differences. Um, for example, certain types of discrimination were prohibited only in certain strands and tests for direct and indirect discrimination varied slightly between the strands. So that created a bit of a confusing landscape um, for uh, employers and employees to navigate. So in 2010, the Equality Act um, took effect um, and that effectively harmonised and strengthened the provisions in workplace discrimination legislation. And we all became then familiar with the nine protected characteristics um, that we see today. And, and just briefly, um, by way of reminder to any of the listeners, they are age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion and belief, uh, sex and sexual orientation. So broadly speaking, the Equality Act was a bit of a is a bit of a one stop shop now for considering whether there's been any discrimination based on those protected characteristics. Yeah, really helpful. Thanks, Abby. Of course, there's also there's that concept of fixed term employees or workers and part time. So we probably won't be delving into those ones in this session, particularly given they're not intrinsically linked to the individual. I guess that's one thing to say, and they they don't they're not encapsulated in the Equality Act for probably for that reason, one reason or another, they remain sitting in separate regulations, don't they? If any, anybody listening is thinking about those areas of protection, but that's a really helpful um, summary and quick history lesson. And you even went there and listed <laughs> each of the characteristics, thinking I must, I have, missed, I must have missed one, right? And there's got to be one on the list, um, which, was, which was excellent. Um, Rebecca, I mean, when you, when you hear it summarised like that, um, and, and pulling that all together so expertly, it makes you realise there hasn't been much legislation, firstly, and certainly legislative change at all since what started in 1975. So um, the Equality Act was really consolidating stuff we already had um, with some changes slightly to the way that protected characteristics were, were defined. But, you know, given that we talked about this massive change in attitudes in society, what in some areas is unrecognisable in comparison to the 70s. Why has the system not just become completely unfit for purpose and into disarray? Yes, I think, I think I'll think i pick up on a point Abby made about the Equality Act has almost given a one-stop shop. If it, if it actually had, that would actually be quite nice, I think, because we could just look at the Equality Act and we could say that's our point of reference and probably it would mean that employment lawyers were out of a job it would probably mean right. hr die. well <laughs> i don't know i've still got a little bit lo lo longer left but i think we we probably would find hr directors and hr you know managers etc would feel it's a lot less complex to navigate sort of the areas of discrimination but what we've got alongside that equality act is just just countless. We've got codes of practice, we've got ACAS guidelines, we've got all the case law, and probably, you know, we don't have, I was going to say we haven't got a day that goes past without a new discrimination case. That's probably a little bit um, um, sort of in the realms of exaggeration, but we certainly, I would say, on a weekly basis, have a new discrimination case. And that's because, you know, the legislation is very much the blunt instrument, isn't it? That's the, you know, that's 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 the, the written um, framework for us all to say, OK, well, you know, that's our starting point. And then the case law has to develop and we have to fill the gaps in the definition um, with the case law interpretations of what on earth um, somebody meant, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, when they put forward 
the um, discrimination legislation for the various protected characteristics. So I don't think, you know, the, the Equality Act itself isn't unfit for purpose at all. And, and what it has probably done and what our system of legislation allows is a, is a flex on, on how we interpret. And that flex means that as society changes, um, so does our um, interpretations of what was intended. And we have, you know, we have all sorts of examples on that. So for example, with, you know, religion and belief legislation, who would have thought that that would have protected somebody's philosophical belief in climate change, for example. Um, so with the with the Granger case a few years ago, you know, to have um, to have a belief in climate change as something that was considered to be, you know, effectively worthy of respect, uh, you know, was quite a big step. Um, you know, to have a philosophical belief in vegetarianism, for example. And I think, you know, that religion and belief legislation has really opened the doors for, um, I was going to say people to be quite creative, um, but rather cheekily, I think it's employment lawyers being quite creative um, in, in how they might assist clients, um, claimant clients with, um, um, with the legislation. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we keep the Equality Act. It's not going anywhere. You know, Brexit isn't suddenly going to put it in the dustbin. So it is still there. Um, and we also have things such as we, we, we have the carrots as opposed to the sticks of legislation. We have the carrots, which are, you know, let's do some voluntary reporting on um, diversity and inclusion in particular. So, you know, voluntary reporting on um, um, you know, ethnicity pay gaps, some voluntary reporting on socioeconomic um, statistics and um, um, inclusion in the workplace. And good employers will use that voluntary reporting um, guidelines as the carrot, um, and they will use that in recruitment, retention policies, and see it as those are the things that really a good employer should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that I think throws up this into sharp relief. This this point for today's discussion, I think, in that you, what you've confirmed there is that the Equality Act is is exquisitely simple in some ways. Gives us this core construct from which to build these protections, and that allows things to flex over time and to evolve in approach in a way that's not necessarily great for employers who've got to look at codes and guidance and case law. Um, but it gives us that flexibility. And I guess then that, that, that the question then becomes, it's like me trying to do yoga. At, at, very, at some point, and it'll be very soon in my case, you flex a point of something until it snaps or it stretches beyond uh, its, its capability of, of, of flexibility. Um, Abigail, there's presumably a category of characteristics that would just be too much of a stretch. We talked about belief and we talked about environmental issues we, there's ethical veganism there's, there's there'll be characteristics that would be just too much of a stretch for the courts or tribunals to to shoehorn in to the existing list do you think are there examples um, of that that are on the horizon i mean i think the legislation is probably flexible enough for the judiciary to try and make a case if it wanted to but i think there have certainly been calls over the years for specific um, characteristics to be standalone protected characteristics and some force behind some of those arguments. And, you know, for example, menopause has been um, a characteristic that has been um, increasingly in the news um, and high profile as something that a lot of people feel should be a separate and standalone protected characteristic. Um, at present, uh, claims um, that are brought um, in respect of the menopause have, have been brought um, based on sex, age, disability, sometimes a combination of, of those, those three characteristics. And, you know, that leads to some confusion, I think, amongst um, uh, claimants as to which protected characteristics should be used. And also actually should 
um, people going through the menopause have to rely, have to say they're suffering from a disability um, if they want to make a complaint as to um, the, the impact of treatment on them if they're experiencing symptoms of the menopause. Um, yeah. Should that be a necessary step for, for them to have to take? Um, and that was something that was looked at um, by the um, Women in Equalities Committee and, and a report was produced um, last year. But the government has so far resisted uh, making menopause a, a separate protected characteristic, but they have set up a, a menopause task force and appointed an ambassador. So, you know, it is an issue that is still live. Um, it may change. Uh, at the moment, it, it doesn't look like there is going to be a separate um, standalone protected characteristic for menopause, but you can see how it's suboptimal for um, um, predominantly women who are going through the menopause to have to shoehorn their claim into um, another one or more existing protected characteristics. Um, yeah. Another uh, one uh, characteristic that's been discussed um, as to whether it should be something that's looked at as a standalone is, is um, the concept of class divide or classism um, and whether that would assist um, social mobility or protect those um, predominantly from a working class background who, um, for example, um, suffer significant pay gap issues um, mm. as a, when, um, when against, you know, those from middle or upper class backgrounds. Um, yeah, that's a good example, isn't it? Because that's an area where I'm thinking this is on this line of that's it's hard, I think, to see yeah. how, you, how you could shoehorn that in yeah. to belief or the race and ethnic back. It's not about any of those existing characteristic issues, is no, it? it? No, it doesn't naturally sit within any of the current nine, um, I don't think. But also, I think as a concept, there are some hurdles or, or some, you know, question marks as to how you would even go about defining class um, because it is it can be quite a subjective um, uh, thing um, so so actually how how would you go about carving that up and and even starting to put some corners of the pitch around um, what is what is your class is it if you have a degree if you've been to a certain school you know if your parents have been to university it 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 does create and throw up a number of questions, I think, as to how how one would start to define that um, yeah, and, course, and how an individual that, sees themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And how would an employer go about knowing mm. whether they, whether someone falls within a particular category? I mean, they throw up these really difficult issues. Um, mm. But yeah, so there, we know that there are some new areas to potential development that we think we couldn't just shoot one in. We would. As it currently stands, we'd need possibly a another category of characteristic. Um, Rebecca, then I'm thinking about disability and, and what Abigail said about that, and that it's 1995. So at, at its um, argument, at least, it was 20 years at least too late. When you think that from yeah. 75 to 95, we didn't have a concept of um, unlawful treatment of disabled people or reasonable adjustments or other protections that now are just so naturally ingrained and you look back and go how how could we not are we we're at risk here of always playing catch up in the legislation given the fast pace of change and I think that pace of change is accelerating not not slowing yes I mean I mean taking that example of disability I mean we've had I suppose you know we've had some development since the 95 um, Disability Discrimination Act in that we've had an extension to um, some deemed disabilities. So mm -hmm. as as the, the, the tribunals grappled with that, you know, that sort of fairly cumbersome definition of a disability, you know, common sense prevailed and somebody said, look, come on, you know, there are certain things that we just know are disabilities. We don't have to, you know, rewrite the rules every time. Um, we, you know, we have a cancer or an MS or, you know, one of the other deemed disabilities. We also have had, you know, the sort of the construct of associated disability discrimination, which, you know, again, case law has pushed, um, pushed to the fore. And that gives, you know, that, that gives a more expansive 
um, protection to those that don't even have the disability. Mm. But playing catch up is, it's probably always going to be there. You know, we 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 had a little play of catch up, I think, in recent cases with long COVID, where, you know, the courts were being yeah. asked, well, you know, do we think that should be a disability? Um, you know, nobody would ever, nobody's ever heard of long COVID, you know, certainly not in 1995 and certainly not before, you know, sort of 20, 2020. Um, but suddenly the courts were there with something brand new to grapple with. Um, yeah. So the reality is, is that we are always going to have to play catch up because there are new things coming onto the agenda. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult to, um, you know, to to set in stone one um you know sort of one specific piece of legislation and say that's it folks we're not having you know anything else and we won't consider anything else you know abby abby you know rolled off the nine protected characteristics you know if you're in um other countries you're going to have to roll off another 20 you know in yeah talk, talk to us about that because, because we, we rely on the case law and the, ju the judges and guidance to evolve in the way we've described but in you, you work internationally and <clears throat> excuse me in other countries like france for example you and i were talking about before this session there's the, the, can you talk us through this more expansive and purposive approach that other countries take at a legislative level so they're not yes, yes. On, on, on creative judges yeah no absolutely um you know so you know taking france as the example i think at last count the uh the number of you know equivalent protected characteristics were was 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 i think it was 20 and you know just looking at some of those some are ones that i would not be surprised if they morphed into um our equality act protected characteristics so things like political opinions uh trade union activities um, they have a specific on physical appearance, or that would come within our disability, um, potentially. Um, but when you start getting down to, we have to protect people in France because they may be discriminated against because of their place of residence, their, um, their place where they actually have their banking, um, their, mm. their ability to speak in a language other than uh, French. And I think one of the key ones, and it goes back to the social, you know, the, the social mobility, the socioeconomic, is people that have a particular vulnerability because um, of economic hardship. So yeah. this is a minefield, an absolute minefield, which has, you know, been set into, you know, codified into the French law. And if you were a French employer, you're having to, you know, you're having to be quite cautious um in, in terms of how you deal um with individuals who may have these protections and it is it, it perhaps comes down to these things are all about you know how we treat people in the workplace so you know are these french examples are these simply there because we should treat people with respect in the workplace um, we have in the UK a concept of um, the implied term of mutual trust and confidence. And in a way, you could just get rid of, I'm not advocating this, but, you know, there is a potential of just getting rid of the, you know, Equality Act legislation and saying, well, look, if you just exercise the implied term of mutual trust and confidence, would that cover um, mm -hmm. everything? You know, you just treat people with respect and and everyone's going to live happily ever after in the workplace um we're not quite there yet but i think that implied term of mutual trust and confidence is is underused and sometimes the legislation is overused yeah i mean uh, it, it's, it, there's an element of uh, the impact on the employer isn't it between this expansive and purposive approach which is pushing to the employer the need to identify and be very clear in its own mind as to which characteristics we're using that expression aren't we are protected and you need to con be aware of legal risk around behaviors and which aren't and there's a similar sort of scenario with disability where many employers will be looking at a set of symptoms and are not sure whether it's protected or not and expands it out into this much broader 
um, sort of notion. And that, that's an interesting angle of implied trust and confidence. Yeah, do, you know, do, do we need anything more? Or, or even if, if you stayed slightly closer to the, uh, what's actually, I think, comes out of the human rights legislation, it's certainly fed into the, our religion and belief element of our protected characteristics, this idea of a, a belief, it's said, but, but maybe a characteristic that's worthy of respect in a democratic society. Abigail, what's the risk with that? It, it, if we said, we don't have nine characteristics anymore, it's just simply if, if there is a characteristic that's worthy of respect in a democratic society, it's protected. Does that solve all our problems and give legislators something else that they don't have to worry about in terms of evolving and updating as they had to do with disability in 95? There won't be extra characteristics added. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I mean, there's an obvious attractiveness on, on one hand to that um, position because it, it, you know, it, it future proofs shifts in society and, and um, leaves the tribunals really then to decide whether it falls to be protected. Mm. Um, I think probably the downside to that, and it's probably quite a big downside, uh, is that it the open-ended approach risks there being a lack of certainty uh, for both employers and employees. Um, defined list isn't perfect, but it at least gives some corners of the pitch to then look at, you know, um, guidance and, um, and and case law around it. Um, I think it, it, it's interesting that you pick up on the, the the worthy of respect in a in a democratic society because that that raises uh, the question, um, and I think we're already seeing this a lot more, and, and will continue to do so. Um, how employers and tribunals um, deal with competing protected characteristics, and we've got nine, yeah. never mind twenty. Um, France have. Um, where one might not sit comfortably with another and, and um, quite a lot at the moment there's, there's a few cases that have been decided or are waiting be, to be decided particularly on on religion and belief and a, as that sits with um, gender reassignment um, yeah. and whether someone who has a belief let's say that um, no one can change um, sex um, or gender um, and they believe that because of their religion um, whether that trumps the person who has a gender reassignment um, um, claim or feels harassed because of that belief and, and how that sits together it's um, it's a real challenge for employers who uh, might think well you know might think quite rightly that these are both um, beliefs um, uh, and issues that are protected and how do we go about managing that in the workforce um, yeah. and I think the the direction of travel um, seems to me um, and it obviously depends on the facts of the case and, and how it's pleaded but how those beliefs manifest themselves in the workplace um, so whether someone is um, using inflammatory language let's say to project their um, religious or philosophical belief um, or or not um, yeah. so sometimes it, cases are won and lost on the manifestation and i think that's crucial um when dealing with that clash of competing beliefs yeah and and and, and, and the expansive approach just raises increases dramatically the, mm. the likelihood of frequency of these competing characteristics as we put them because you two two employees both saying well my situation and my belief or catch is worthy of respect and yeah. the other one says that as well and the employer's caught in the middle and of course as we know it might be surprising though people who look at it to, uh, for the first time that actually the the the, the, le the standard at which a belief must get to in terms of its apparent repugnance to not be worthy of protection in the sense of someone's mm. entitled to believe that is high Mm. You, it has to yeah. go to quite a high level for the courts to go no they're not entitled to, to to protection around that belief and then indeed the manifestation simply stating that you have a belief in a calm not aggressive way may be acceptable whereas an employee you look and go no you can't say that outwardly like that that's going to cause people offense and but the tribunal looks and goes well some people have different beliefs and so they would feel that that's not their view but that doesn't mean that the mm. person's not entitled to say it um 
So we end up with um, you know, much greater frequency of those issues in the workplace, which of course are extremely difficult for an employer to navigate, almost impossible mm. to navigate through that without having at least one, if not both employees feeling like they didn't get their fair support and recognition. Um, and of course, for those with less than two years service, if I'm being slightly cynical now, um, it's a bit like the protected disclosure that comes in just before someone thinks they're about to be told they're not performing up to standard, um, that people weaponize some of that, mm. a belief that maybe isn't necessarily genuinely held. Um, obviously, that would be that would be rare, but it's possible. So, uh, Rebecca, even even if the UK doesn't rip up the Equality Act sections around characteristics and adopt this very expansive approach, what we're what we're learning here is that there are dramatically different approaches across different countries to how we identify characteristics capable of or worthy of protection and and those that that don't in some countries do in others definitions are different how does a multinational you've looked at this before with clients um with global gatherings that they're doing countries people in different countries coming together they've got different rules that apply to those different groupings how do they manage the risks associated with that it's like the office party isn't it but uh, you know well yes on, on an even it, higher it, level of, of risk yes the, yes i mean you know we all know that hr dreads the office christmas party and um i think hr probably dreads the you know global annual you know corporate conference more because suddenly as you say you you have a whole load of different uh cultures coming together um you have potentially the local country officers of those um of that you know sort of global company that you know may well have different local country rules um and and suddenly everyone's expected to behave in the same way probably um and certainly not bring over some of the more perhaps um less palatable aspects of what they might you know be more akin to doing in their in their home country so you know by way of example you might have you know a country that's known for its known for its hugging it's very tactile um and it's um um you know big slaps on the back and air kissing and, and all sorts of things you know heaven forbid that might be seen as sexual harassment by certain mm -hmm. um yeah. certain other employees you know but what do you do do you do you completely rip out every other country's cultural um norms to create you know a one sort of size fits all autonomous or, or or an um, automatic sort of employee model yeah. it's 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 so difficult that's why so many global companies i think are putting together codes of conduct which say look this is how we expect you to conduct yourself you know at all times in your own country you know and when you're with colleagues from other um companies they'll put in place training um uh, on a global level you know with with employees from the different countries attending that training to try and get a sort of consistent approach of look you know these are your colleagues that you're working with and that you need to respect and that you need to understand that you know there may be aspects of um you know their normal behaviors that don't necessarily fit in with yours but you know let's talk about that let's understand mm -hmm um what we need to do it's you know not dissimilar to employees that go on international assignments and who are given training in um you know the cultural norms of the particular country before they go you know so yeah. you know do you shake hands you know how do you give your business card to um you know a business partner overseas in a particular um company but yeah it's 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 really really difficult to you know minimize the risks of different uh, um different approaches in different countries but from the employer yeah. perspective if they can show that they have 
you know, sought to manage that as best as they can with, with their codes of conduct, with some training, with that training being in quite close proximity to some of those big events that they have as well. I think that's important. You know, mm. if, if, if they know that there could be an issue, then they put the training on, um, you know, within a, uh, you know, relatively short period of time of that particular conference or that, you know, office event. Yeah. Well, that's that. Yeah, exactly right. You talked about minimising risk. Realistically, you you work. You can't eradicate risk in that sort of scenario. It's too complex, and you're dealing with multiple different human beings behaving in different ways. But minimising it, and of course, we can we can but hope that in most jurisdictions that might apply, the employer will be better placed if it can show it did at least some or all that it reasonably could have done to ensure the environment was right and people understood how to behave. We know we've got yeah. that concept of all reasonable steps defence in in uh, England and Wales, and hopefully there are similar concepts. And it's just good practice anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. but you won't. You uh, employers need to give themselves a bit of a break as well, and think you know it's it, it's impossible for us to remove all possible risk, but we equally don't feel comfortable just sort of throwing everybody into a room and just saying let's see what happens. Um, yeah, we're going to try exactly. to manage and, and 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 your point earlier about trust and confidence and the broad idea of respectful behaviour making sure people understand what we mean by that and that we all try to be as considerate as we can um things might happen that culturally jar a little bit but at least that's it's done with uh, everybody understands the positive intent uh, that's sitting behind behavior so i mean it, yeah, yeah. It, it's not dissimilar is it i guess to the challenge of trying to create sort of a global approach to bullying and trolling online you know in governments and legislators saying how do we control behaviors that are happening on, on, on the internet and you're looking at global standards of conduct and, and mutual respect, and it's very difficult to make a one size, size fits all. It's, it's not easy, but we've got to do it. Um, and I guess that's a good point for us to sort of look, look to wrapping up on this one, as I'm thinking in my mind without alienating the, the, the audience on your last point of succession, <laughs> if anybody watches it, and the Roy's going to Norway to meet their merger partners and the cultural differences there. If anybody wants to see this kind of issue in action and the tension that's caused uh, i'd recommend watching that um and i'm not only commissioned for uh, for hbo in <laughs> that, obviously other 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 shows are available but um to each of you coming back to the point of characteristics obviously there, there's lots of talk about consultation around developing it maybe addition additional characteristics coming in the future final thoughts from each of you uh starting with abigail what would your bet be as the most likely next new protected characteristic and why? Well, Adam, uh, call me cynical. I don't think we'll have any new ones anytime soon. Um, I think there's been, which is probably a bit of a disappointment, disappointing answer, isn't it? Um, there was very, a recommendation from, <laughs> well, I do think there'll be some changes. There was, a, I mean, there was a recommendation from the European Court of Human Rights in 2012 to add political opinion and affiliation and, and that was rejected in 2013 by the government we're even even more of a febrile political landscape now with with brexit with various independence causes that's uh, that's potentially one that might be re-looked at again um in the future but i but i think the government of the day or whoever that might be may land on well we can probably fit that in with um, philosophical belief, yeah, belief if we yeah. need to um, so so you know if it's if it's a high enough bar it'd be protected already by that what I do think there will be is an update or addition to section 7 of the Equality Act um, to more appropriately address gender identity um, particularly in light of you know where society is is moving to some of the cases that have been and section seven being the gender reassignment protection protected characteristic um because it doesn't really deal with gender identity at the moment it deals with gender reassignment and mm. of course there are individuals who are may not be proposing any change in in, in sex but in fact want to express um what they identify with or perhaps mm. what they don't or, or maybe that they don't identify with any gender at all yeah, yeah and, non binary non binary yeah, yeah. And, and at the moment um the 
the language of section seven doesn't really um i mean it's been shoehorned and interpreted in first instant ca instance cases to to cover gender fluid claimants uh, and offer them some protection um but i think we've moved on so much in the 15 years since that wording's been introduced um that that will be updated or clarified um at some point in the future that would be my best guess as to the most likely change okay, i'm gonna let you get away with two there <laughs> and, and that you don't have to say which is which is going to arrive sooner I'm going to be generous on that um <laughs> Rebecca, I'm yeah, sorry that you so, went second because uh, you, you, no, you might no, have had no, one of your I'm answers gonna, stolen. There. No, Abby didn't take one of mine. I'm only going to do one. I'm going to wrap up quite quickly with this one. But um, my money's on carers. So, some, you mm -hmm. know, some specific protection for those with caring responsibilities. And the reasons are we've got an ageing population. So we're going to have far more carers coming in. We've got a stretched NHS Um uh, you know, government funding, if it can put the responsibility onto, you know, individuals to be carers, then um, they are going to do that. And we're seeing it more and more. Um, and working and caring puts such a massive strain on individuals that, you know, they may have dips in performance, uh, they may need to take more time off. And we've seen, obviously, a degree of protection for carers in flexible working, um legislation so you know um the, the the right to request if you're a carer although obviously that's likely to be expanded to everybody soon but you know so there has already been um some advancement or an acknowledgement of the difficulties that carers have in um having a a more flexible um employer um, which will make their caring responsibilities hopefully a little easier. But I think that we need more than that for carers. We need some. We need some specific protection for them. So that's um, that's my bet on the next protected characteristic. Yeah, and that's a vote winner as well, isn't it? You're, I, I'm guessing you're thinking yeah, around, absolutely. around the yeah, uh, no, next, I think it would be. Yeah, I think because most yeah. you know, the demographic of most biggest population of voters is is a, a late an, an an older demographic. So maybe that's a political expediency there as well feeding in um yeah really interesting um thank you we'll, we'll close with that um had a really interesting discussion there uh around the issues of protected characteristics and what might happen going forwards and the difficulties of these international gatherings which i thought was very interesting so a uh, reminder for everybody listening to follow our podcast on linkedin and um uh, there'll be information on our website with links to other materials articles and reading lists as well if you want to hear more or look at more on the subject and we will catch up with you at the next time.